Perfect time to connect to the community. That's why the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI, will be there. We're learning more about NAMI today and about the programs they offer. Joining me now, Executive Director Kumi McDonald. We see oftentimes stage four, which is people on the streets oftentimes, mm. but there's many people who are stage one or two that are struggling and suffering in silence. And so we want to bring that out into the open and saying that it affects one in five of us. Hi, I'm Kumi McDonald. I am the executive director of NAMI Hawaii. NAMI Hawaii is a national alliance on mental illness, and we bring support, education, advocacy, and awareness for individuals and families affected by mental illness. I'm Anissa Wiseman. I am the program director and walk manager at NAMI Hawaii. My mom, she is diagnosed um, bipolar disorder with severe psychosis. Um, and that's how I found NAMI. I had an interaction with my mom. She was living homeless on the beach in Mokalia. I didn't know what to do anymore. I went home, I did a Google search, didn't know what I was looking for, and I found NAMI. And I started attending their support groups where I found group wisdom, which is very, very valuable, and just the support and knowing that I'm not alone in this was also very helpful too. So I was struggling on and off with mental health issues as a youngster all my life. Somehow I didn't understand it. I wasn't able to get help when I needed. As a child, I remember asking my mother, please help me, I'm struggling with anxiety and depression, and she didn't know how to help me. Fast forward, now I'm a mom, and my son, who was a college student, became severely depressed in his junior year at UH, and became, um, you know, stuck in his room and just so suicidal and so very depressed and it made me want to do something to help people like me and like my son. Mental illness is an illness. It's not someone who's being lazy or who's being irrational. It's an actual illness of the brain and moods and you, your thought processes are interrupted and you're not thinking clearly. It affects your body. So it's not just your mind, but it also affects your body, your relationships, and your ability to cope in society. Here's a question for you. If you were going to invest now in your future self, what would you focus on? One of the world's longest health studies sought to find the answer to that question. Their lives gave researchers evidence that our relationships with others keep us happy and healthy. Dr. Robert Waldinger is a fourth director of the study, which continues tracking the roughly 60 surviving members. Good morning to you. Good morning. You know, there's a great quote, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to get the author right, but the, it was about that the way we judge a society is by how they treat their most vulnerable people. And the homeless are among the most vulnerable people on the planet. And she put out her hand to him and said, Daddy, Daddy, wait, I'm on a call. <laughs> Many homeless people um, are alienated and frightened, particularly if people suffer from mental illness and if they suffer from addiction, as many homeless people do. Finding ways to connect with them in non-shaming ways and hearing what they feel they need is really important. We want them to fit into the systems we create for them and that's understandable, but sometimes we just, we really need to listen to what their concerns are and we really need to make it make them feel safe enough to get treatment particularly if they're suffering from mental illness the question is how do we make it safe for them how do we listen to them and gain their trust and then make it safe enough for them to come for treatment and when we treat mental illness people are more likely to be able to stay in housing and to fulfill other kinds of obligations the strongest predictor of how people were going to grow old was how satisfied they were in their relationships with other people. So many people just ignore homeless people. Like you just walk down the street and you ignore them. For a homeless person, you start to feel ignored and maybe you start to internalize that a bit. I mean, if you have the same message getting put into your brain every single day and like affirmed by every single person that you interact with, eventually you will start to believe those things about yourself and it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy with no way out. For me, if I was homeless and so many people kept ignoring me, I feel like I would have to have some resiliency.
Who you sit here about? I got it on the wedding. We've been there like five times. And I had to right. relocate. They said this is how it works. Hey, you heard about that? You they heard that buddy guy? My baby don't do what my daddy we don't pay. want we have to say. To take it. You got it. Like for something. Three hundred something like that. Okay, check it out. I love my chest. I love my. I'm gonna do on one side. Okay. Let's see North Shore. Let's do it first. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's Be responsible. Paying your bills. The one. The most. Bring your bills. And um, none of this stuff. <laughs> Taking care of yourself. Hey, dude, this is cranking on the North Shore, man. Big waves only. Yeah, I would like to go to college, but I can't afford it. Wait a minute, I'm a good person. Oh, yeah. Just because I'm a victim of circumstance doesn't make me a bad person. Good to know that people yes. actually care. Of course, yeah, I know, we care. Yeah. from PTSD, anxiety, and depression myself, um, so that's what I strive for, to be able to recognize my feelings, communicate them, and then regulate them as well. But some people on the other, uh, other side will say, let's not call it a mental illness, let's call it a mental health condition or a lived experience, because every human experiences some type of a mental health issue. Every human. Like, I even have a hard time because it's because of stigma, like I understand the fact that we need to call it a mental illness so that people look at it that way, but then uh, it also feels like a duality because are we further stigmatizing it by calling it an illness? When I am able to answer the phone to another family member in crisis and I am able to share my experience, even when sometimes I don't feel like I'm able to give them a clear cutthroat answer, I'm only able to share with them through my own experience of like my experience of what happens when a family member um, goes to castle and, and you know all of those things when I'm able to share and even though I feel like it's nothing that I'm sharing to them it's it's so much it's I, they're finally getting an answer even if it isn't what they wanted to hear it's it still is something and it, it, it gives me value and it makes me feel like I went through what I went through for a reason so that I can continue to help and support other people through it as well. It's about giving families hope and when I come and give advice or share something, they don't listen, but then when I say, look, I'm a mom, my son had suicidal depression, I, I get it, I, I'm not, I don't understand everything you're going through, but I get it. Then they go, tell me more, and they're willing to listen. And then when I said, now these are the steps that we took, this is what NAMI did, this is the programs that I've been through, education classes I've taken, and it's helped change my son's life, my life, it gives them hope. And that is what we're about. We're about giving families and individuals hope that there is hope for recovery and a better life.